After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now the Lord Jesus asked a question there, but we need to understand something. When the Lord Jesus asked a question, it wasn't that he might learn anything because he knew all things. He's omniscient, he knows all things. But rather, the next verse proves it, says, this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousands. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to his, the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained, over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into his ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The day following, when the people that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save the one wherein his disciples were entered, that Jesus went, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, now unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, whether neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not, for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. God will bless the public reading of the Scriptures. Of truth. Uh, on a message, I believe, and when you're mostly involved in a Bible teaching ministry, although evangelism is a part of that too, uh, we seek to expound the scriptures. But I've called this uh, study Evidence to Encourage. All of us have been through very difficult days. I remember uh, in the first lockdown, though that first week, and uh, uh, we needed exercise, and my wife has serious heart situations, and uh, where we live is on a slight gradient, so we drove down to Carrick Ferguson Park at the harbour, and there's a lovely flat marina to walk along there. 
and we were amazed. It was like a ghost town. There was the wish of the wheels as an occasional car drove on that normally busy, busy road. And it suddenly dawned on us that this pandemic had really gripped the land. And then, of course, I have my own view on the scientists who have driven this. I personally think the country might have been better if they'd been sent to a desert island with their computers and the government had done what they're elected to do and that is govern the people. But that's a personal opinion. And all of us vaccinated, and all as most of us I'm sure are, we have to realise that our times are in the Lord's hands. My times are in thy hands, my God I wish them there, the hymn writer wrote. But even during that, we have a death in our own church. We had a man who died, he was 90, and uh, his wife had already died, and uh, after he was buried, and only his daughter, and his son-in-law and his granddaughter were by the graveside. No church funeral was allowed. Our pastor said to me, he said, it was worse. There's a sense of desolation, even though we felt the Lord's presence at that deserted graveside. But he said, the family didn't get the kind of farewell for their loved one that they would have liked. And this could be repeated again and again. And then some folk have succumbed to COVID fatally, and some with still lingering health problems, and then continually. There are health problems and there are all sorts of situations. People have lost their jobs or have seen their business crumble. People are going through difficult, difficult times. We alluded to that when we sang those words in our opening hymn, Days of Darkness, still may meet me sorrow's paths I often tread. So we all all of us, preacher included, needs evidence to encourage. Now, I hope we can do that as we seek to expound this wonderful passage of scripture. I've segmented this in, I think you're accustomed to my style of uh, presenting uh, scriptural truth, and uh, the first thing I want us to notice is a grand providence. Now, sometimes Theological words baffle us. They shouldn't, we shouldn't let them baffle us. For instance, you talk about sanctification. Sanctification simply means to be set apart for the Lord. Justification means that God views us just as if we had never sinned. Or as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And providence. What is providence? It's by divine foresight or interposition. It means that God knows everything about us. He knows what will happen. There's a lovely hymn that says, I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. There's another one, and it says, uh, I know who holds the future, and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow with its problems large and small, I trust the God of miracles. Give to him my all. That's a great comfort it should be to all our hearts. Sometimes we worry about what might happen. Joseph Scriven in his great hymn that we sing probably uh, at least once a month in all our churches. Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God and prayer, because he knows the end from the beginning. Trust in the Lord, counsel Solomon in Proverbs, with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And we're experts at leaning onto our own understanding. And problems come. There's a big problem here. There were 5,000 people to be fed, and it seemed that there was nothing to feed them. In fact, in some of the other gospel accounts, the disciples said to the Lord, send them away with nothing for them. They admitted defeat before handing it over to the Lord. We're all like that, aren't we? 
We're experts at leaning onto our own understanding. Problem comes and we rack our brains and we use our own understanding to try and figure out the solution. When God just says, would say to us, just trust me. Trust in me with all your heart. That means roll the whole burden onto the Lord. Peter says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now I can tell you this. When you're going through the dark days and the problems come, the devil said to you, your God doesn't know. And if he did know, he doesn't care. Lies. Because the devil is a liar from the beginning. And if God says it, then he contradicts it. Why, that's how our sin came into the world. He didn't just contradict evil and say it. God didn't say it. Hath God said? Do you think God really did say that? And he began to wobble. And then he gets more bold and he says, you'll not die. In other words, he was saying to her, your God is a liar. And we need to realize that the devil is the enemy of souls. Peter tells us he goes about as a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. But sometimes he comes to us, as he did to Eve in the, gar- in the garden, as the angel of light. And everything seems so right about the lies he sows into our minds. And the province of God is God's divine knowledge and foresight about everything. You see, my dear friends, even in this turbulent, troubled world, God is still on the throne. Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 1 and verse 11 of his letter to them that God is working out all things, all things, after the counsel of his own will. He's doing that globally. But it thrills me more that he's doing that individually in your life and mine. That our God cares about us. He cared about us and loved us enough to send his son to Calvary that we might be saved and might one day dwell with him in glory. And he cares about every detail of our lives. Joseph Scriven was right. We need to carry everything to God in prayer. We pray together, of course, but my wife has a long list. And it takes her quite a a long time to go to get to it. And she will sit up on bed and she systematically goes through that list, praying for people. And they're on that list until they're cured or the problem is solved or they go to glory. And we need to carry everything to God in prayer. But here's, you say, where do you get a grand providence in this? Here's the problem. There are 5,000 people there. And the Lord Jesus says to Peter, what are we going to do about feeding them? And Peter immediately, the grey cells start to work, and he says, 200 penny worth of bread? No, that wouldn't even be enough. That every one of them should take a little. But you see, the Lord Jesus has said this. He asked that question to prove Philip. And Philip failed the test. Philip could have said, Lord, we have seen already the miracles that you can do. You can feed these people, but no. Do you know, no matter how often we have seen the Lord work marvelously in our lives, we still doubt. We're all slow learners, aren't we? If we are honest about it. This he said to prove him. And here's the providence of God. He himself knew what he would do. Nobody knew about that wee boy with the lunch. Only Andrew, but the Lord knew. The Lord knew there was a wee boy with a lunch, and he knew what he was going to do with that little inadequate, so it seemed, lunch. You see, my dear friends, the Lord Jesus knows everything. There's a lovely verse at the end of chapter 2 of this gospel. It says that many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. You remember in that great post-resurrection chapter in John 21, 
when the Lord is recommissioning Peter after his abysmal failure in the garden. And three times he asks him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And finally Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. As if Peter said, Lord, you know as well as I do how abysmally I fail you, but you, you saw my tears of repentance and Lord, I love you and I want to serve you. Lord, you know all things. Sometimes that can be a sobering thought for us. The Lord knows every thought that is in our hearts. Let me turn to a lovely psalm. Psalm 139. It's a psalm of David. And he said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. That's amazing. God knows what's going on in our minds. Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, said this on one occasion. He said, I'm glad my forehead is not transparent so that people can't see the thoughts that sometimes bombard my mind. You understand my thoughts afar off. You compass my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. That hasty word, that thing you wish you hadn't said, God has heard it. So we don't only apologize to the person we hurt, we ask the Lord's forgiveness. He said, you've beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. And then he's overwhelmed, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. Well, but what a wonderful thought it is that God knows all about us. He knew what he would do. Child of God this morning, you might be in the midst of a dilemma that is leaving you perplexed. You don't know what tomorrow is. Never mind the day after. And I want to assure you that God knows what's ahead. I do not know what lies ahead the way I can't see. But one stands near to be my guide. He'll show the way to me. And my dear friends, he knows all about us. He knows the heartbreak. He sees the tears. In Psalm 56, David said this, Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? There's a friend of mine who's now in the glory. In fact, I was speaking to his wife. She was at a church I was preaching at a few weeks ago. And uh, he, wrote a, he wrote a little poem about God's bottle for tears. You see, my dear friends, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in our authorised version is John 11:35. Jesus wept. We often sing that hymn, don't we? Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. He himself knew what was about to unfold from verse 7 and verse 8 onward. The Lord knew all about that. He knew about it. That problem that we can't resolve, that thing that's worrying, and you know, one of the things we fail to do, we're told to cast thy burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. You should be a piece that so was sang. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. But we're experts at taking our burden to the Lord and then taking it away with us again. Take our burden and say, Lord, only you can do this. It's all to you. This is beyond me. It's beyond my ingenuity to figure my way out of this. I trust you to resolve this. A grand providence. He himself knew. But then secondly, there is a gracious provision. Philip puts the further stumbling blocks. <laughs> I've worked, it out. I've worked this out in my mind. Lord, even 200 penny worth of bread wouldn't be enough that everybody would have something to eat. And then Andrew. Andrew is a wonderful bringer of people to Jesus. Remember, he first findeth his own brother. 
when you hear Peter preaching that great sermon on the day of Pentecost and saying, that same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him Lord in Christ. Do you know where that started? The day that Andrew brought Peter to the Lord Jesus. And here's Andrew again in the scene. There's a lot here. And he has five barley loaves and two small fishes. It's fishes, but what are they among so many? And even he, in a sense, expresses Philip's doubts. Even, this is a wee boy's lunch. What good would that be? What are they among so many? 5,000 people here. You know, there was a lot. I've tried to sit in my study and think of how this originated. I think this wee boy had heard about the Lord Jesus. Maybe even his parents at home were followers of the Lord. But he wanted to go and hear Jesus for himself. And I can hear him saying, Mom, I want to go and hear this great man, Jesus. Will you make me up a wee lunch? Maybe she said to him, you'll be hungry. I'll make you a wee lunch. And the wee boy turns up was not the slightest idea how important that lunch is. In 2021, we're still talking about it. And what the Lord, not so much the lunch, but what the Lord did, did with it. There's a lad, the source. There was a lunch that speaks of submission. I would love to know the words Andrew used but they're not recorded in scripture to get the lunch out of the wee boy's hands and into the Lord's hands. A selfish wee boy would have said, hold on a moment. My mother made that lunch up for me. It's mine. And I'm as hungry as everybody else. This is my lunch. Remember, remember, Naboth took that attitude when David asked for some refreshments for his men. He said, I'm going to take my animals, my food, my... Everything was my, my, my for this wealthy man. And remember her, he, he, David's men were mad. David said, get on your sword. He was going to go and he was going to destroy the house of Naboth. And when Abigail heard what was going to happen, she dressed the kid and made refreshments and she came and she met David. And you know what? Abigail is described in the scripture as a woman of good understanding and a beautiful countenance. And as you read that in 2 Samuel 25, 1 Samuel 25, you can almost sense Abigail drawing the venom out of David. She says, when the Lord has made my Lord king over his people, then you'll not regret that you took the law into your own hands. And David, from being in a state of fury, right on a murder mission, he turns to Abigail and he says, Abigail, may God bless you and blessed be your advice. And at the end of that chapter, God's, God smites Naboth that he dies. And Abigail becomes David's wife. Do you know, our God is able to do, and you apply this to your circumstances as I try to apply it to mine God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think but this wee fella yielded what he had to the Lord you see my dear friends I feel that so many Christian lives are suffering from partial consecration Paul tells us in Romans 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. For years those words used to burn themselves into the depths of my soul, a living sacrifice. Someone said the problem with a living sacrifice is it wants to crawl off the altar. But a living sacrifice means what it says. It means that we are holy to the Lord. Oh, make me holy thine. We can sing these hymns. All to Jesus I surrender. But we don't mean a word of it. I remember a Sunday, and in the middle of Tom Orr's uh, ministry, he broke a series he was on to preach in Romans 12.1. And I remember the closing, it was Romans 12 and 1. 
presenting a living sacrifice and the closing hymn is I Surrender All. And I remember, I love music and I love singing, as you know, here in Coleraine, but I didn't sing a word because I thought, I can't sing that from my heart. And I looked around and said, if half a dozen of us sang that with meaning, we could turn this district upside down. But this wee boy, this lunch was all he had. And he gave it to Andrew. And Andrew said, I'm going to give it to the Lord, the lad, the lunch, the lesson. Paul often thanked the Philippians for their support of him. He said, you once and again sent unto my necessities. And then he said, you know what will happen? My God shall supply all your need, not just some of your need, but all you need. God has promised to supply our need, not our greed. There used to be an ad on the television when very few people drove a Mercedes or a BMW, those prestige cars, and the, the, the voiceover said, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? And that was designed. The cupidity, the cupidity there was they make, make people want that. Before the escort wouldn't have been good enough. It had to be a Mercedes. You see, my dear friends, God has promised to supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. <clears throat> There's a wonderfully challenging chapter in 2 Corinthians in chapter 9, and Paul says this, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. And when, when you live by that, you see the fruits of that in your Christian life, because God is no man's debtor. A gracious provision. 5,000 people here. And the disciples, the other gospel records say, send them away. We can do nothing about it. It's not our problem. But the Lord Jesus made it his problem. But he didn't only make it his problem. He provided the solution. You know, God has said, I will meet all your needs. Supply all your needs according, not out of, according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And before I leave this gracious provision, let me look at a practical lesson here. The Lord Jesus took this provision, and it says this, and when he had given thanks. Do you give thanks for every meal you sit down to? Even if you're in a wee coffee shop and it's just a cup of tea or coffee and it's gone, do you bow your head and say, thank you, Lord. This is your provision. I think we should do that more now because during the lockdown, when we were out and we began to be able to go and shop, you couldn't go in and get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. I'm more a tea man. Occasionally I'll have a latte, but you couldn't. And we thought, it was just a simple thing. But do we thank God for it? doesn't matter who's around. Sometimes that can bring conviction to people when they see that there's someone who gives thanks. There's a story I've told before, an evangelist in Canada early in the last century, and he tracked across Canada preaching the gospel. And he found a restaurant and he went into it. He said, I hadn't a cent in my pocket. But he said, I was really hungry. And he said, I went up to the counter and ordered my meal and I sat down. And he said, I scoffed a lot. And then I thought, now comes the moment of truth. I have nothing to pay for it. And he walked up to the counter and he said to the man behind the counter, I have to pay for my meal. It's free. He said, when I opened this restaurant, I vowed that the first person I saw giving thanks to God for what was before him, the meal would be free, and you're the first. And the man who recounted that story says, how God delights to honour faith in himself. 
But what, what triggered that in the restaurant owner's heart? The fact that someone gave thanks. My dear friends, we need to learn this. And things both great and small, every good and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's the practical lesson. But the spiritual lesson is this. God will never fail to supply all we need. A grand providence, a gracious provision. And the third thing I see in this narrative is a grievous perplexity. The, you know, the aftermath of the feeding of the 5,000, the Lord Jesus says, Don't, no waste, no waste, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. And they gathered up the baskets that remained. And there were 12 baskets which remained over and above that which had been eaten. Isn't that amazing? One lunch, 5,000 people, and 12 baskets filled with the residue. Only God could do that. Do you know, my dear friends, when we trust him, there comes those times and those times in our lives when he overwhelms us so much that the blessing is nearly too big for us to receive us exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. This happened to me maybe in a small way on the afternoon of my surgery when it was behind me. And the staff nurse, who had been very good and dealt with me that morning and so on, in fact, she said to me that morning, David, this, your, your theatre's ready. Would you like to walk into it? I thought you had to get wheeled into a theatre. And I walked into the theatre. And then she said... There's your operating table. Would you like to climb onto it? And I climbed onto it, and I'm looking up. The big lights aren't still switched on. My surgeon's there, and the nurses are putting on all the posts and all things you need. And I remember, I thought, I'm not only in the hands of these lovely people, but I'm in the Lord's hands. And of course, the anaesthetic was talking to me. She asked me, have I ever, ever, ever had an anaesthetic before? And I told her, yes, and told her what it was like. And she laughed. I said, it was in my first year in grammar school, and I broke both bones in my wrist in a fall. And I told her what the anaesthetic experience was like, and she laughed. She said, it's not like that now. Asked me about my family and all. She was actually giving me the injection to put me out while she was talking to me. And I knew nothing until I come round in the recovery ward. And the staff nurse who had dealt with me was talking to me. She said, David, do you know something? You were the first cancer operation in this hospital for four and a half months. That nearly blew my mind. And the verse of scripture that came to me, my surgeon had said to me, I want a pristine theater for you. I don't know why I said that, but I was the first cancer operation there for four and a half months. And the script that came to my mind immediately was, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And there's 12 baskets filled with the residue. My dear friends, what a God we have. And then the story takes a different turn. When evening was come, the day is getting darker. And he entered into his ship and went over the sea. And it was now dark. And Jesus was not come to them. I wonder, are you there this morning? You're in the midst of a dark and difficult experience. And it seems that the Lord is not there. I want to tell you the Lord is never not there. There's a couple and the holiday we had, that short break in Wales. And they sang a piece I hadn't heard for years. Sometimes our skies are cloudy and dreary. Sometimes our hearts are burdened with care. But we may know what error may befall us. Jesus is always there. Remember that business about the devil being a liar? God isn't there at all. God doesn't care. God doesn't know what you're going through. Of course he does. And of course he is there. 
and here it is. It was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. Where was he? He was in the mountain top praying for them. My dear friends, we are never out of the thoughts of our God. Oh, that this would grip our souls. Sometimes when we seem to be oblivious of that, he is mindful of us. It was dark, and Jesus was not yet come. I think we've all been there. We sang that in Roman hymn, Days of darkness still may meet me, sorrows pause I off my tread. And it seems that prayer is not being answered. And it's a tunnel, and there's no light at the end of it. It's now dark. And where is Jesus? He's not here, but he is. My dear friends, he's never not with us. Though I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. When Jeffrey Bull was imprisoned by the communists and the Chinese Communist Party is as evil now as it ever was then, Jeffrey Bull said he never lost a sense of the presence of God. In a communist prison cell, deprived of everything, no Bible, nothing but recalling the scriptures that he knew from memory. That's why Colossians 3.16 is so important. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I remember when I committed the anesthetic, my mind was just filled with thoughts of the scripture. While I was away on holiday, we completed year 32 of reading right through the scriptures. We're now setting out on year 33 to read right through from Genesis to Revelation because uh, if you're in ministry, this, has got, this book has got to be the foundation of all ministry. Not we stories, not a wee word to tickle the ears, but the strong meat of the word. Do you know, at the center of Paul's counsel to Timothy was this, preach the word. Many churches are on the rubbers today because the word is no longer preached. They're trying out that idea that they tried out that church down the road and it's packing them in. We'll do the same. Nobody on oversight seems to say, what saith the scripture? That ought to be the template for every decision we make. What saith the scripture? And in the darkness, I want to tell you, he's ever near to bless and cheer in the darkest hour. When I'm tempted, I can feel his power. At his side, I'll abide, never more to roam, till at last, fighting past, he will take me home. I learned many of those things when I was a kid, and they've stayed with me in the memory bank, and they contain great spiritual truth, don't they? Grace, there is my every debt to pay, blood to wash my every stain away, power to keep me holy day by day in Christ for me. It was now dark and Jesus was not come. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind. You may feel a storm is raging around you. So let me look at this quickly. The consternation in the storm. But fear must be conquered by faith. And you see, the thing is, the Lord Jesus came to them walking in the water. And they were nearer to Christ in the water than on the ship. Mark puts it like he said, the wind was contrary. My dear friends, the worldly wind out there is contrary to everything that is of God today. Do you ever remember a time when we were so bombarded by the LGBTQ+, plus? they seem to be adding a new letter onto it every month. And we were bombarded with it. And if we take a biblical stand against it, all the ugly words they can muster up, we're homophobic, we're intolerant, my dear friends, we are faithful to the Lord. That's what matters. It's required in stewards that men be found faithful. Faithful to him, true to his word. Consternation in the storm. And going to pass over the rest of this quickly. Calm in the storm. We read this in Matthew's account. Matthew tells us that the Lord came walking on the water. And Peter, being Peter, he came down out of the ship 
and walked in the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to crink, sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? We do doubt, don't we? We often refer to doubting Thomas, but we can put all our own names in there, couldn't we? Most of the time. Calm the storm. But I want to tell you something. The wind ceased. Child of God in a difficult situation. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Remember many years ago we weren't all that long married and my wife was seriously ill and so much so that our own doctor brought out a professor from the city hospital at 11 o'clock that night and he tried to reassure me and said if what I've given her doesn't work ring Dr. Stewart in the morning. Dr. Stewart says he won't need to, I'll be out. She was a, a spinster, elderly but a superb doctor. I remember that night there wasn't much sleep and I tumbled and tossed in the dark before falling asleep and I remember as dawn began to break it was January so the nights were long and dark I just was never as glad to see daylight I want to tell you in spiritual terms weeping may endure for a night but joy cometh in the morning then of course not just consternation in the storm and calm the storm, but Christ in the storm. He comes and he says, It is I. Be not afraid. No fear. Be not afraid. Good cheer, it says in Matthew. Be of good cheer. I'm near. And here's the thing. Do you see that, that verse that is translated? It is I. It's the same Greek word for I am. You remember that's what hurt the Pharisees when he said before Abraham was I am that was a claim of deity and here the one who's walking on the water yes it's a miracle but really it's simply the creator exercising power over his own creation that thrills me in our troubled turbulent world God is still on the throne and he will remember his own who trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. That sea, he created, he conquered it, he calmed it, and as he walked upon it, every troubled wave, where was it? Under his feet, child of God, every troubled wave of that turbulent sea is under his feet. He's in control. He asked us to rest in him, to trust in him. But don't we sing that hymn? He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock in the midst of a dry, thirsty land. He does. He's the rock of ages. Then his consideration in the storm. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew, and he said it here, he said, you don't seek me because you saw the miracles, because you had the loaves. You've got a good feed. That's why you're after me again. And of course, I said, they considered not the miracle of the loaves. His love in time past forbids me to think he leave me at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms his good pleasure to help me right through. And there's another miracle here. Did you notice it? When they willingly received the Lord Jesus, verse 21, into the ship, immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. There's another miracle. When the Lord came into the boat, the storm ceased and they were right there. I want to tell you, his presence will never fail until the moment we land on Canaan's shore, so to speak. And then finally, and forgive me if I've overstayed my time, a great principle. The Lord Jesus said this, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. 
the Lord Jesus ends the story of this narrative by enunciating this great principle. Labor not for the meat that perisheth, but that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. In other words, in plain speaking English, get your priorities right. Remember the Lord Jesus urged his followers, he said, don't lay up treasure on earth, lay up treasure in heaven. Here on earth, moth and rust corrupt, corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but treasure in heaven. And Orr set out for the mission field with her husband. They went by boat in those days. I was a young fellow then. And Molly Harvey, who was uh, a veteran missionary with that Greek gospel mission, she had told us they were looking forward to this first young couple coming out. And Ina took ill on the boat, the ship that was taking them up the Amazon. And she died. They stopped at the town of Labria, and Fred Orr, her husband, was distraught. It sold their home and his business to go and serve the Lord in Acre. Acre. And they were nowhere near where God had called them to be. And Dinah had died. You can guarantee 100% that the devil attacked him. What a fool you've been. Here you are in the middle of nowhere in this God-forsaken country and you've lost your wife. Where is your God? You can bet on that. But Ina was buried in Labria. Fred stayed there because that's where she was buried. And Brazil was a country then, as the south of Ireland was at that time too, dominated totally by the Roman Catholic Church. And after a time, the priests came to him and said, right, you've been here long enough, go. And the ordinary Roman Catholic, 100% Roman Catholic people of the town of Labria said, no, Senior Fred, stay here. His wife buried here, he stay. There's a thriving church there today. Ina had become the corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died. My own sister was an agri-missionary. She and her husband she had to come home because of illness. And uh, she had, and it's still there, Paul still has it there. She's dead 11 years now. And he has it, a photograph of a wee boy that she led to the Lord when he was nine years of age. And he's one of the leaders in the Brazilian church today. You see, my dear friends, God is no respecter of persons. And God always honours his word. And here's the great principle. And I remember Joan Abney singing this one night at the Missionary Convention, and I was accompanying him on the organ at that meeting. Into the vineyard of Christ would I go, bearing the burden of life here below, seeking to please him, my Saviour divine. My heart is yielded. His will shall be mine. Only one life. T'will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Saviour, thou gavest thine all for me. Gladly I yield my life to thee. Labour not for the meat that perisheth. One day we'll stand before the bema. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll receive rewards or suffer loss. The bema is totally different from the great white throne, which is for sinners. Our sins have been judged when we came to the cross for salvation, but we be judged there at the bema for our service. Woodhouse double, burned up. Gold, silver, precious stones, standing the test of the fire. May God bless what has been shared from his word. I think we should sing a couple of verses.